the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. <clears throat> Let me start by saying that this is my, uh, my most favorite season of the year. I love this season. And I know that it's the least favored, uh, favorite season for a lot of people. Don't understand the meaning behind it, you know, the fast of the apostles and the Pentecost. But let me tell you that, you know, it's, uh, you know, when God really opens our eyes to see, we'll find out that Pentecost, which we celebrated last Sunday, and we will continue actually to celebrate for the rest of the Fast of the Apostles, just the greatest season of the year. Let me prove that by two points. You know, Jesus, what did he say to the apostles when he was leaving them? He said something very strange. And we hear it, and it just it, it passes by our heads. You know what he said to the apostles? He told them, it is better for you that I leave. Have you heard that? It is better for you that I leave. Imagine that Jesus is here amongst us, and he's telling us, you know what? Let me go. I have to leave. And it's good for you that I leave you. Does that make any sense? It doesn't. But listen to the rest. And he said, because unless I go, the Comforter or the Holy Spirit won't come to us, won't come to you. Meaning, it's much better to have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us than Jesus physically around us. Meaning that we are more privileged than the disciples before uh, when Christ walked with them. Can you imagine that? Basically, the Lord asked the disciples to tell him, okay, go, please go, because we need the promise of the Father or the gift of the Holy Spirit. That proves to you, if Jesus was around them, the Holy Spirit is the presence of God inside and each one of them and inside each one of us too. But you know what? I feel like the Holy Spirit is the most ignored part in, in, in our spiritual life. And actually one of the fathers of the church said, that the goal of Christian life is to be filled with the Spirit. The goal of the Christian life is to be filled with the Spirit. Sometimes I feel like we don't know who the Holy Spirit is. We don't have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. We don't know how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We don't know how to be led with the Holy Spirit. That's why we said maybe God wants us to, you know, to, to do a little bit of a study here that's so important and so essential that Jesus himself said, it's better for you that I leave that you may get the comfort of the Holy Spirit. We want to know more about the Holy Spirit and his work in us and his work in the church, how to get that, how to be filled with that. What is my relationship with the Holy Spirit? Am I led by the Spirit or not? Am I guided by the Spirit or not? Do I have the fruits of the Spirit or not? Do I have the gifts of the Spirit or not? And what the difference? What is the difference between the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the fruits of the Holy Spirit? Okay? These all things we want to discover basically through studying a couple of chapters only from the book of Acts. Somehow we started a series right now which is the first week of, of the, the Fast of the Apostles and we just celebrated Pentecost. So I felt God is saying, you know, this is what you need to focus on. The Holy Spirit in the church and in the life of every and each one of us. Because unless we build a strong relationship with the Holy Spirit, then it doesn't matter. Because the goal of Christian life is to be filled with the Spirit. Okay? So we're going to do that uh, hopefully in three or four sessions at the most. Okay? And we're going to study 
the first couple of chapters of the book of Acts, but we're not going to focus on everything, and we're not going just to focus on, 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 on everything comes uh, our way, but we're going to focus more on the work of the Holy Spirit, who the Holy Spirit is. And, you know, what do we do with the Holy Spirit and how to be filled with the Spirit, as I said? <clears throat> Before going through this chap this book, the book of Acts, I just want to give you some something very quickly on that book, just two, three words. Because the goal is not to study the book of Acts. We're not going to study the book of Acts. The book of Acts is big and it's going to take a lot of time. We're just going to study the work of the Holy Spirit in the early church and how it shaped the church and it shaped the believers. And what is the difference? Why aren't we living the life of the early church? And you will find that the only difference is that church was led totally by the Spirit and was filled with the Spirit and we are ignoring that a little bit. We're depending on other things. Okay? So, Book of Acts. Book of Acts came right after the four Gospels. Okay? And it's basically, it's a, it's a, it's a history book. It tells you what is the history of the church after Christ ascended to heaven. What happened to the, the believers after Jesus left? And you tell me, okay, well, it's a history book. I'm not into history. Didn't get the best grades in history, you know, classes. And, you know, I'm not into history. It has nothing to do, actually, with history. The book of Acts, actually, it's called the, the Acts of the Apostles. It's basically all the four Gospels and all the teaching of Christ. If there is no practical application to it, would it make any difference? Jesus came, taught very good lessons, said nice words, died, rose again. But if what he did did not affect and influence people practically and their lives and made a difference, then it's useless. So basically, if there is no book of Acts, then the four Gospels are going to be theories. So basically the book of Acts is the application of the four Gospels. You guys asleep? The book of Acts is the application of the four Gospels. If there is no book of Acts, how would I believe the Gospel? How would I believe that the teaching of Christ is something that you can live by or practice? tells you basically how believers lived the commandments and the life of Christ after he died. And I can give you an analogy between, you know, Christ and the church. You know, the four Gospels is like the book of Acts. Four Gospels is Christ and the church is hidden in Christ. He came, he's the body, you know, that, you know, he's, he had the church within his heart. The book of Acts, you see the believers or the church, but what's motivating them? Christ in them. Christ and the church is in him. Book of Acts, the church and Christ is in it. The book, the, the gospels, the work of Christ and the miracles of Christ and the book of Acts is the growth of the church and the work of the church and the miracles of the church and the gospel is Christ, and the book of Acts is the church who is the bride of Christ. So they're complementing each other in just such an amazing and unique way. And it goes along with the goal of this year. Because in the beginning of this year, we said that we have a vision that in order for us to grow spiritually, okay, every one of us has a cap in his spiritual growth. You know what that cap is? Hmm. We're individuals here. What is the cap on our spiritual growth? Hmm? Comfort zone? Hmm. Like 
Can you, if you're, if you're here in the church, can you grow spiritually without limit or there is a limit? What is the limit? What is the cap that's always going to, to cap you in, a, in your spiritual growth? Believe it or not, it's the church. It's the church. You can't be so spiritual and up high and lifted and live in heaven and the rest of the church is sleepy. You come here in the church, there is nothing going on. And there is no fire of the Spirit. There's nothing going on. Even if you're, if you're going to go up heaven, it's gonna br- that church is going to bring you down. The other believers, the fellowship, your cap will always be the church. Let me say it in other words. I said it before in the beginning of the year. Imagine that. A church or a community that doesn't have a priest, they pray once a month, they bring a priest from out of town, pray once a month, a liturgy, nothing after that. Versus another church where it's very active, there's always prayer meetings, there is you know, Bible studies, there is mission, there is this, there is that. Can believers grow the same way in both churches? No. There's no way. And even if you grow, versus if you're an active church and the church is very lively, if you're down, what the church is going to do? It's going to lift you up. But if the church is sleeping, it's going to bring you down for sure. I've seen that a lot. So in order actually for me to grow, for me actually as a priest, we have to grow together. When the Holy Spirit came upon the church, it didn't come to Peter and at his house and to, to John in his house and to Andrew in his house. No, when they're gathered together and the Holy Spirit came upon all of them in unity and fellowship and the church grew all together and everybody grew. Everybody spoke in tongues. Everybody has had the gifts of the Spirit. The church was on fire. And everybody was on fire. And if anyone would be sleeping in the church of the apostles, he must be dead. Because the church is so lively. The church is so lively. So believe it or not, we need each other. We need to work together. We need to put our hands together. It doesn't depend on me, I promise you. You think it depends on the, on the priest or, or the leadership? No. A lot of times, I promise you, what drives the leader is the enthusiasm and the work of the people and, and, and the thirst of the people, you know. A lot of times, I don't want to do 50% of the stuff that's done here in the church. But there is a lot of pressure, you know. I'm the priest, I can't say, no, come on, let's not do that, you know feel even embarrassed, yeah, you know. So I get challenged. Why? Anytime, you know, there is, there is a chance to, to have a liturgy, and I don't do a liturgy, I know that some people are going to come and say, how come there isn't a liturgy on that day? Huh? You want to sleep? Of course, yani, thank God there are few people, but, you know, I'm actually afraid of them. So I make sure that, you know, to get my acts together. And so on. I don't know what kind of mission trips we have. You know, there is, and I can't say no, mission trips. Well, yeah, wonderful, you know. <laughs> Even though I'm not going to go to every and each one of them. But, you know, there is, a, there is pressure. So it's good. It's positive. But you know what? If we grow, we have to grow together as a church. And if the Holy Spirit would come and fill and lead, he's going to lead everyone. As it happened in the Church of the Apostles. If you want to deal with the Holy Spirit individually, there is a problem here. And you're going to miscommunicate with the Holy Spirit. Okay? So, we want to learn more about that. And we want to grow. And the more we want to study the Church of the Apostles, we want to imitate that. All the church, there was grace upon everyone. There was fire on the prayer. You know, everybody was on fire. Everybody was praising God. Everybody was performing miracles. Everybody had gifts of the Spirit. Maybe not 100%. 
let's say 99%. There is two people that you'll see in, in, in the book of Acts, chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, when they drifted, what happened to them? The church is like a train who's going 2,000 miles per hour. Anyone stands on the way, what's, gap, what's gonna happen? It's gonna be smashed. Because the church is full of life, full of force, and it's going forward. And nobody could stop that. And Jesus said, even the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Who's driving that train that's going 2,000 miles per hour? What is the power that's driving that? What is the power? The Holy Spirit. That's what we're studying, okay? Come on. Okay? It's the Holy Spirit. And we want to grow in that. That's, that's being spiritual. That's being Christian. You know, it's being filled with the Spirit. So, let's go through uh, the, the first couple of chapters in the book of Acts and see that uh, uh, in, in, in the writings. <clears throat> okay, so if you, if you open the book of Acts chapter 1, we're going to read, explain a little bit here and there, but focus on the verses that we want to focus on. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all Jesus began both to do and teach. What is the former account? What's the former account? Who wrote the book of Acts? St. Luke, the writer of the third gospel. You go back, okay, so you believe me. I know that some of you don't believe me, so open Luke chapter 1. Okay? St. Saint Luke starts his, like, inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order the narrative of those things which have been fulfilled amongst us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus. So he's writing his book to someone called Theophilus. Who is Theophilus? Someone who's good, someone who's excellent, okay? He's an excellent person, okay? We don't need to go through that, but, you know, He's uh, a Roman, um, one of the noble people that St. Luke wrote to. So that's the first account. Here he says in the book of Acts, the former account, the gospel, I made with Theophilus of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. St. Luke was one of the 12 disciples, right or wrong? Right or wrong? He is one of the 70 apostles, right or wrong? Oh my. Yes, he's one of the 70 apostles, okay? Why don't we start from Genesis? <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We're just going to stick with the book of Acts. <laughs> Okay, so St. Luke is not one of the 12. He's one of the 70 apostles that, that Jesus chose and he sent them everywhere. Where is the commission to the 70 apostles? In which chapter? Quickly. Luke 10. Good job. When is the commission to the, 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 the 12 disciples? Matthew 10. Matthew 10 is the commission to the, the 12 and Luke then is the commission to the, the 70. He was one of them. What was, his, uh, uh, what was his job? Physician, very good. What, who did he help? St. Paul. He actually accompanied St. Paul in all his trips. Some, some people say he accompanied him because he was, St. Paul was sick all the time and he had a he wanted a private doctor with him all the time. That's nice, huh? So, and, and when you read the 
throughout the account of the book of Acts, you will see we did and we went and we had and so on. So he was an eyewitness. He was there from the beginning. Okay, so the former account both that Jesus began to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. He wrote till the ascension. Until the day in which he was taken up after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen to whom he had also presented himself alive after his resurrection, after his, res uh, his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So basically, after the resurrection, Jesus is spent with the church, with the apostles, how many days? 40 days. He spent with them 40 days teaching them things pertaining to the kingdom of heaven. What did he teach them in 40 days? Huh. One word. He, teach, he taught them the church. Very good. How do we know that? Well, there is nothing written about the 40 days and what happened in it. Other than we know that Jesus appeared to them so many times. And here it says that he spoke to them to things pertaining to the kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven? What is the kingdom of heaven? Where is the kingdom of heaven? He was talking to them about heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven? Kingdom of heaven as... Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is within you, where God is a king. God is king in heaven for sure. They treat him as king in heaven for sure, but not here on earth. But the only part here on earth that belongs to heaven and belongs to the kingdom of heaven and to the kingdom of God is our heart, is within us, where Jesus is a king where the Holy Spirit dwells and makes Jesus a king. The work of the Holy Spirit within you. You know what the Holy Spirit does? Jesus said, He will tell you all things, and He will remind you with everything I have said to you. He will tell you, He will teach you all things, and will remind you with everything I have said to you. And he will take from me and give you. What does that mean? Means that you can never have Jesus as a king in your life without the Holy Spirit. How? What does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit basically open your eyes and your heart to see who Jesus really is and what he did for you. Let me give you an example. You're praying. You're in the Holy Week. You saw a movie. You read a book. And all of a sudden, I know that most of you will relate to that. All of a sudden, you will discover, oh my goodness, I didn't know how much God really loved me. We always say, yeah, God loves me. I know that he loves me. I know that, that Jesus died for me. But you know what? I really didn't know how much that is. Wow, that's a lot. That's amazing. I don't deserve that. Here is the word. Once you said this, this key word, Lord, I don't deserve that. This is so much love. This is too much for me. It means the Holy Spirit is opening your eyes to know who Jesus is. To make Jesus king over your life to make him the lover of your soul don't ever think that you read the bible and see that jesus died for you 
and then your heart is full with passion for God and love for him? Absolutely not. Unless the Holy Spirit opens your heart and your eyes to that, he will take what is mine and give to you. He will teach you all things and remind you with everything I have said to you. He will make Jesus a king in your life. He will make you love Jesus. There is a word, there is a verse in the Bible that says, No one can say Jesus is Lord except to buy. No, seriously, let's go to Genesis 1. <laughs> These are simple verses. Okay, I'll teach you that again. No one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. No one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will teach you, not only teach you, but fill your heart with passion for God. Opens your eye, open your eyes to what God really did for you. Sometimes he will show you how sinful you are and how holy God is. Not to put you down, but to fill your heart with passion for God. How the Almighty Lord, the, the, the one who is just full of, full of holiness, loves me, the sinner. Why? I don't deserve that. When the Holy Spirit opens your heart, you stand in prayer without saying one word, and you cry saying, Lord, I don't deserve to be in your presence. Who did that in the Old Testament? Who did that? Isaiah. Very good. Which chapter? I'm pushing it, huh? Sorry. <laughs> huh? Who said Isaiah 6? Okay, good. Isaiah 6. Isaiah, good prophet, nice man. Okay, prophet. Went to the temple to pray, and all of a sudden, oh my God. I don't deserve to be in your presence, Lord. And he saw God, and he, he saw his glory in the temple. What is that? It's by the Holy Spirit. And he said, let me touch you. So you are first from all your sin. Do you have that Holy Spirit that leads your prayer and fill it with passion for God? That tells you, oh my, I don't deserve to be in his presence. Not in a negative way, but in a very positive way. The Almighty Lord is just listening to me. I'm sure at a certain point this has happened to you. This, when your prayer was led by the Holy Spirit. This should be the case in every single prayer to be led by the Spirit because no one can love Jesus without the Holy Spirit. No one can say Jesus is Lord without the Holy Spirit. No one can do any positive thing in the church without the Holy Spirit. No one can teach in the church without the Holy Spirit. Nothing positive. No one can, can talk about the love of God without the Holy Spirit. That is the kingdom of heaven. That is the kingdom of heaven. Okay? He was teaching them about the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. Jesus told the disciples, the Holy Spirit uh, hasn't come yet. He said, okay, now I'm ascending to heaven, but stay in Jerusalem till you receive the Holy Spirit, which is called, another name is the promise of the Father. That's what he said, okay? Right here, okay? He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Why the Holy Spirit is called the promise of the Father? Mm. Any answer is appreciated. I'm not going to make fun of you, even if you say something silly. At least you broke the silence and you had enough courage to say. Why it's called the promise of the Father? 
and actually see that the word promise is just capital P. Like this is the word, promise of the Father. Why the Holy Spirit is the promise of the Father? The promise. Not a promise from the Father, it's the promise of the Father. Uh, it's very important to know that. Hmm. Because there were prophecies about it. It's you mean it's gonna happen? Oh, because oh he promised that he will he's gonna give you the, the, the spirit so it's gonna happen. Oh no, it's not that meaning. I know what you mean. It is like I promise you it's gonna happen. No, it's not that. That's not the meaning. It the, the meaning is not the father promised that he will give you the spirit. And it's gonna happen. No. Because that's why it's called the, the promise. It's all in this, you know, T-H-E, the promise. Yes. The only way we get salvation. That is very true. And, you know, it's amazing how even after the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, he said, there is something missing. Can you believe that there is something missing after the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus? Yes the Holy Spirit. But, no, that's not what I mean also. But thank you for the answer. It's, you know, brought a good point. What's the promise of the Father? Why it's the promise of the Father? You know why? He said it's the promise of the Father? Because he knew that someone like you and me will say we're not worthy to have the Holy Spirit. We're bad. We're not holy. We're not good enough. He said, no. It has nothing to do with you. It has to do with the Father. Because he promised. He's going to give it to you regardless. I want to tell you a verse in Romans 8 where St. Paul says, if he gave his only begotten son for us, how can he give us everything with him? Another time in Luke 11, he said, if you, being evil, know how to give your children good, good gifts, how much more the Father from heaven will give, will give what? The Holy Spirit. He wants to give spirit not that he promised and that's why it will happen no it must happen it depends on him it's his generosity this is the best gift the father will give you you know what's the the best you know it's you can understand it more in arabic you know when you say see someone and you tell him ya ruhi addi lak ruhi like you're my spirit, or I'll give you my spirit. That's what the Father said. When you are baptized, you are in the shape of Christ. So the Father looks at you, and wow, you look like my son. I will give you my spirit. It's my promise. I want to do that. You know why? Because without me, you cannot do anything. If you cannot even say that Jesus is Lord except with the Holy Spirit, how can you do anything without the Holy Spirit? You must get it, and you will get it. It is the promise of the Father. That's why you stand before God and tell Him, this is your promise. This is your promise that you will give the Spirit. Not to, to, to the good people, but to the people who need it like me, when the disciples received the Spirit, they were scattered. They were confused. They didn't know what's next. Most of them betrayed and left Christ, and they were embarrassed. And when they saw him, they felt very unworthy of his love. And with their unworthiness, the Holy Spirit came, and they changed. They, be they became different people. Why? Because it's the promise of the Father. He knows that you without the Spirit cannot do anything. 
you must have it. If, if the Father gave his only begotten son for you, why not giving you the Holy Spirit? Because you're bad. Jesus died for the bad. Jesus died for the sinner. If you keep saying, I don't deserve the Spirit, I'm not getting the Spirit, I'm not worthy for that, then you're going to miss the point. The spirit is there. The gift is there, but you're not opening it. You're not using it. That's why next time we'll talk about the gifts of the spirit. Do you believe that you have gifts from the spirit? Or you don't believe in them? And what is the gift of the spirit? by The, way? the spirit gave gifts to people. He gave some people to speak in tongues. He gave some people to do miracles to heal. He gives some people to teach. He gives some people to, to, to prophesy. To, to prophesy. He gives some people to, to do the work of administration. If you say that you don't have any gifts of the Spirit, I'm afraid you're saying, I'm not a believer. And Jesus is not in me. That is not true. But, Maybe there is an open gift that you received. Or maybe, as St. Paul said to Timothy, that you need to, um, to, uh, to stir up the, 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 the spirit that is given to you, the gift of the spirit. Stir it up. You could have the best fire. But you could put it down. The Holy Spirit is like a fire. But we're very good in putting down the fire. But we want to learn, know, how to stir up this fire. How to make it always. You know what's, what's our problem? And, and I said that actually in a, in a, in a, in a, a, a prayer night that we had the other day. That we get visits from the Spirit. And visits different than dwelling of the spirit. Visits is like I get spiritually high, you know, and I just go down again. That's not the dwelling of the spirit. The dwelling of the spirit is the fire is there all the time. We need to do that. We need to learn that. This is the time to do that. This is the time to learn that. And I just want a promise from you. This is the promise of the Father, okay? What is your promise? Your promise is really to dedicate the next couple of weeks to know about the Spirit and to see where is your life from the Holy Spirit and from the work of the Holy Spirit. What are the gifts of the Spirit in you? Do you stir up the fire of the Spirit or you quench the fire of the Spirit? Do you grieve the spirit or you put it on fire within you and have to be filled more and more every single day? First of all, what we know now, it is the promise of the Father. So no one can say, no, it's not me. It's not my gift. Well, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, nothing matters after that. And if you have the Holy Spirit, you must have the fruits of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, which we will talk about in the next two times. But today, we know that it is the promise of the Father. You must get it. It's your right, and you have to ask for it. If evil people, evil parents, not evil parents, Jesus said that if you being evil, like evil, we have evil nature, know how to give our kids the best gift, how much more the Father from heaven will give the Holy Spirit for those who ask. Okay? So ask for your right regardless who you are. You're down. You're, 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 uh, there is sin in your life. There is weakness. There is laziness. How can you ever get out of this without the work of the Spirit? Don't ever think that I have to Get out of my situation first so the Holy Spirit would come upon me. No, it doesn't work this way. The apostles were messed up 
And the Holy Spirit came and takes them up. That's how it works. People don't believe. The Holy Spirit comes. They believe. People are sleepy. The Holy Spirit comes. They are on fire. But you need to know it is your right. And you must ask for it. Or what Jesus said here, to wait for it. Wait for it is the same thing like ask for it. Wait for it knowing it's coming. I'm not leaving Jerusalem until it comes. I'm not leaving this fast without being filled with the Spirit. Make sense? Make sense? You're interested in that? You're going to ask for your right? It's your right. It is the promise of the Father. We didn't say that. He said that. You know the kids? You promised. Okay? <laughs> you promised. Did I really promise? Did I say promise? <laughs> you promised. Okay, fine. You know? Regardless. But, you know, some parents, you know, do the wrong thing. It's like, okay, I promise I'm going to give you this. And later on, oh, I took it back because you were naughty or you didn't listen. No. You promised. Khalas. You know? Too late. You promised and then I became bad after that. But you promised first. Okay? You have to fulfill your promise. It is that promise of the Father. If you decide that this fast will end without you getting your rights, it's your choice. Okay? But it's the promise of the Father for you. Good? Any questions? Fantastic. Let's stand up. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our Heavenly Father, it is your good pleasure, Lord, that we have your Holy Spirit. Because this is how we communicate with you, Lord, in the same wavelength. This is how we understand you, Lord. This is how we learn everything. This is how we grow, Lord. This is how faith will become an action and will live like the acts of the apostles, Lord. Like we, we live the practical life of Christianity, not just words. We're fed up, Lord, with words, but we want acts, and the acts will never happen without your promise, without the Holy Spirit. Lord, you knew, even when you were with the disciples, you taught them everything, you gave them everything, you made them even do miracles, Lord, and it wasn't enough. You died for them, Lord, and it wasn't enough. You rose again, it wasn't enough, Lord. You had to give them your promise. Because without the promise, they cannot do anything. Lord, we ask for that. We're seeking the kingdom of heaven first. Lord. We're not asking for money. We're not asking for materialistic things. And we're not asking, Lord, for, for, for anything worldly. But we're asking for your promise, Lord, and nothing but your promise. You promised, Lord, that you will fill us with that spirit if we ask. Lord, we will dedicate this time of the year just to ask. We know, Lord, it's the season of gifts. It's the harvest season. It's the feast of the harvest that we will, will gather, Lord, and we will get and we will receive from you. Will you shower us, Lord, with your blessings from wherever we don't know? Lord, you know that we, we cannot do anything. We open the Bible and we don't understand. We stand up to pray, Lord, and we're, we're just, uh, our mind is all over. We need your gift. We need your blessing. We need your spirit, Lord. We're like the twelve. We're like the seventy apostles, Lord. Without the Holy Spirit, we'll, we'll still be, be selfish and we'll still be worldly and, and won't understand your will and won't understand what you want from our lives. We need that Holy Spirit, Lord. And we promise to wait 
and ask, like you asked the disciples, to wait and ask. We're waiting, Lord, and we are asking. We'll wait, Lord, the, the, the time of this fast, and we will pray every day, Lord, and we will we'll, we'll just wait for your promise, knowing that you have to fulfill your promise, Lord. We didn't promise that. You promised, but we promised to wait. And wait on you, and only on you, Lord, knowing that we will receive, Lord, because you're you're good, Lord. Because when you when you say something, Lord, you do it. You're not like us. You will never fail us, Lord. You promised, and you will fulfill, Lord, that you will bless us, Lord. You will bless the church. You will bless the church as whole, Lord, and you will bless every and each one of us. That you will bless all the events, Lord. That the, the meetings will be led by your Spirit. Like the prayers will be fiery, Lord, with the Holy Spirit. That, that everything is led by your Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would, would lead every and each one individually. And will lead the church whole, Lord, and, and make a revival here in the church. That we can grow, Lord. And, and we can be on your image. And we grow from glory to glory. And and become like your son. Holy Spirit come. And fill every part of our heart. Of our will. Of our emotion. Lead us. Spirit of God. The spirit of holiness. The spirit of purity. Spirit of righteousness. Kill all the, the sins that's hidden here and there. And convict our hearts Lord. With any sin that is there. In order for you to dwell in. We're ready, Lord. We're waiting. If you want to convict us with sin, Lord, convict us. If you want to tell us anything that we need to go ahead, Lord, and do it. If you want to fix, if you want to rebuke, if you want to chastise, we're willing, Lord. But we're waiting for your promise. And we will wait. Your only advice for the disciples to wait. And we are waiting on you, Lord. Waiting in prayer, Lord. We're not going to, to, to wait, Lord, on our couches or on our beds, but we're going to wait on our knees, knowing that we will receive from our generous Heavenly Father. Thank you for your gift. Thank you for your promise that without this promise, Lord, we cannot do anything. We'll be paralyzed. We praise you. We glorify you, Lord. We ask that you lead the church, Lord, and, and, and put the, the spirit on fire, Lord, within the church, within every and each one of us. We ask, Lord, to protect the rest of the body of Christ, the rest of our body, Lord, that's in Africa, Abuna Anthony and the group there. That you be with them, Lord, that you lead their trip and bring forth the right fruits, Lord, from this trip, that they become also full of fire, Lord, and, and encourage us and encourage the church. We thank you, we praise you, we glorify you, Lord, for everyone who is in here, Lord. Through the prayers and intercession of our Holy Mother, St. Mary, St. Mark, and all your saints, hear us and pray. Thank you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth that is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for then the kingdom, the power, the glory forever and ever. Okay, be before I dismiss you, we have servants meeting slash small group leaders meeting right now, right here. So if you're